Yeah, I'm filming. Um, someone mentioned about uh, doing a little video uh, on uh, an old school video, installing a 13B on a, on a first generation. This has been done forever and ever. It is probably the, the, the simplest swap for rotary engines that has ever existed. Um, it, it's, it's so basic. Um, basically, you take out your 12A, you bolt your 13B into the original first generation gearbox. This gearbox, just like the RXA gearbox, are, are good for about uh, 380 horse, no more than that. Actually, this early box is probably a little bit stronger than the RXA box. Um, you simply take your old school 13B or even the new ones, um, take the original 12A front cover, put it in, because every rotary engine up through the third generation, the architecture of the block is the same. So you can take this 12A front cover, put it in, buy from Racing Beat the uh, oil pan from the GSL SE, <clears throat> which is an original miles apart, still available. Racing Beat has them in stock. And um, it's, it's a drop in, it's like sticking your foot on an old shoe. It is the easiest conversion that exists. The only thing that you actually have to do to make it work is the, the bridge what they call the bridge, which is the, the motor mount on the 12A. Since the 13B is 3 eighths of an inch longer, you simply have to drill a hole, uh, not 3 eighths of an inch, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 3 quarters of an inch, a hole further back for your, for your engine mounts, and that's it. You, 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 you line up the hole with the top of the slot that you have on both sides, drill the hole there, drop the motor in, and you're done. Same fan, same radiator, same shroud, same air conditioner. Um, everything is the same. Obviously, you have to make you know an exhaust system uh, by a 13B header, and you're done. If it's going to be a natural aspirated motor, it is like taking a 12A out and putting a 12A back in. There's nothing to do except modify that front uh, uh, motor mount, which everybody calls it a bridge. In this particular application, um, we're putting in a turbo engine. So it's a little bit more work, but you know, you got from there to there, dead space. Obviously you have the radiator. From the radiator forward, you have 18 inches. Actually, if you consider the bumper, you probably have almost two feet to do whatever the heck you want. So we've gone ahead and mounted an intercooler here. Got the uh, turbo in place with a um, relatively inexpensive um, eBay exhaust manifold, um, which is a, a copy of the Gretti exhaust manifold for the third generation. As you can see, everything fits perfectly. Right now, we got the turbo in place. We're doing the uh, intercooler pipes. Um, on the third, we're going to run a third gen upper intake because it works really, really well. Could have used a turbo too, uh, could have used any one of them, but. I like the third gen, it makes real good power, excellent drivability, and um, the only issue is that it puts the throttle body facing in this direction instead of like the old GSLZs that came over the top and back on this side, or your switchboard engines. That being the case, you'd have to run both your charge lines from turbo to intercooler and back on this side. In this application, we've got to go across the intercooler and come back around this way. So. The only thing that's costing us a little bit of, uh, of some ingenuity is running the charge line between the air conditioner and the battery box. But there's still a large enough space there that you can take a three inch tube, which is what everybody uses for a charge line up to about 600 horsepower and put it like that. So the intention is basically to come underneath the radiator adjacent to the shroud on top of the AC unit and come back to where the uh, third gen throttle body sits looking this way with a Gretti elbow, be a straight shot. Obviously, this is being a turbo motor, we're gonna go with a uh, simple standalone injection system so we will no longer have the distributor um, which sits relatively high 
We'll put in a crank angle sensor from any second generation, uh, 86 through 91, any of them, turbo or non-turbo, they all work exactly the same. And um, it, it could not be simpler. It's like stealing candy from a baby. Does this engine have work done to it? Yes, uh, actually not that much. Um, this particular project uh, is kind of a father and son project. They want to have something that they can work together and take to the shows and stuff like that. So um, the dad was really concerned about not building too much power. But uh, regardless, you know, a, a decently sized turbocharger on a rotary engine, depending on the boost level, even if you keep it low, you're still going to make close to 400 horsepower, if not more. So this engine is actually a turbo two block, but we have third generation internals inside. Um, three millimeter apex seals and mild port work. That's it. Idle like a Cadillac, um, but with you know with uh, enough boost. And by that I mean you know 15 pounds of boost. This thing will make over 400 horsepower to the motor, over 360 to the wheels. More than these little tiny tires are going to be able to handle. So um, it's straightforward. It's easy. Just um, don't think about it twice because you know rebuilding a 12A engine. Your best luck, your best luck at rotor housings are 40 year old already. So it makes absolutely no sense to drop any kind of money into a 12A uh, engine because the rotor housings are old, older than most people that are willing to go into a project like this. So it makes absolutely no sense to try to rebuild a 12A engine. Um, they're, you know, the parts are just old and overwhelmed. So get yourself a 13B, 86 and forward, whether it's a six port, whether it's a four port, whatever, and bolt it in straight, 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 zero, um, zero headaches application. In this car, we went a little bit further, which is gonna, you know, it's causing some, uh, some extra work uh, because it will, uh, it will be at a moderate power level, not at a big power level. Um, the, the customer decided to put the, the, the turbo transmission. That being the case, you have to modify the box where the shifter in, uh, is in so that it comes out in the same spot as the original shifter on the car because the turbo transmission is physically, uh, well, uh, bell housing to drive shaft is about the same, but the box, the shift selector box, sits a little bit further back. So that required a slight modification, and also it's going to require a custom-made drive shaft. But besides for that, it's basically a drop-in deal. What about engine management? What type of computer? You know, something like this. These cars are so lightweight. Number one, number two, they got tiny, tiny little tires. So you're going to make more power than the car can handle. So there's no real sense in spending a bunch of money on some crazy standalones. You can get yourself a very basic Microtech. Nothing, nothing about the Microtech that it's basic and, and, and less powerful than other ECUs. It's just very uh, short on features, but it manages the engine as good as the very best ECUs that exist. So much so that some of your top level drag racing cars in the world, whether imports, whether rotaries or something else, use Microtech computers. They don't have any features, they don't have no idle control, uh, no idle up for the air conditioner, um, you know, none of the features that you would use on a, on a if you wanted to do data logging and, and, and telemetry and, and um, you know, driver selectable uh, maps per gear, doesn't do any of that stuff. It's a simple standalone system that absolutely works and it works fantastic. And that's what we're gonna put in here. Very simple. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing. You have to upgrade the fuel pump because you know these cars came carbureted and we're putting an injected motor if it were a uh, non-turbo engine and you ran 
you know, either a Holly or a Weber or an over the top, uh, like the old Racing B Delorto kits, which you can get the manifolds, but the Delortos don't exist anymore. But you can put a Weber, you can put an SK, you can put a Makuni, you can put a, you know, whatever side draft you want. It would come over the top. The factory fuel, uh, fuel pump would be more than sufficient. So it's straightforward. I mean, there's very, very little to think about. As you can see, everything from the original 12A is in place. This little cut is simply to make room for the uh, turbocharged line. I said this motor had uh, uh, from what, the 93 13B yeah. internals? 93 rotating assembly with three millimeter seals. Very, very mild porting. So it had the rotors from that model too? or? Yes, yes, the rotors, the crank, and the, um, yeah, that's basically it. The rotors, the crank, we put three millimeter seals on the rotors. Nothing special, no, no not, even, not even balanced. Um, I mean, those are very light rotors, and, and you know, they're good for close to 9,000 RPM in stock configuration. Uh, 93, uh, third generation flywheel, pressure plate, uh, second gen clutch mechanism. Uh, well, actually, the pressure plate is of a second gen because it is a push type rather than a pull type like the third gen. But um, basically, it's a turbo two block with third generation internals. This is not going to be a performance application. This is going to be more of a show car. It is perfectly suited for that. I use second generation low compression rotors and all my big power engines. This is basically going to be a, a cruiser, a show car. Um, more power than those little tires will ever be able to handle. So perfectly suited for that. Protect LTX 10. There's drag racing cars that make 1100 horsepower on that little ECU. It only controls engine function. But for this, more than necessary.
Taylor made. Like they say in aviation, trim to fit and paint to match. <laughs> this piece is not going to lose any of its structural integrity because it still grabs the radiator uh, in this bolt and this bolt, which will, you know, sustain it. And we already have the half moon cut on the radiator support to match this side. So in essence, once it is bolted together, it'll be one piece. Too much because you may end up overdoing it and looking ugly or worse excessively weakening the part so sometimes it just takes some trials to make it right what is that hole for here anything Nothing. important And if it was something important, that charge line is more important. <laughs> so what body kit is he putting on there? Oh, he's putting a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful body kit, uh, uh, an IMSA GTU body kit, like that real beautiful black one that's on the internet from Australia with the yellow stripes on it. Uh -huh. Just like my old, my old red one. Oh, okay. Uh, the IMSA body kit with the big, nice uh, Kent flare fenders. Yeah. It's gonna be gorgeous. Hey, Ed, can you find the edges? Wow. I started in it already, is that it? Really? Yeah. Good. And we've got the gearbox on already made. Fucking it. A lot further along than I thought. Okay. That's excellent. That's excellent. Why does this need a custom drive shaft? Because it's got a turbo gearbox. So it's longer? Bigger, it's got a bigger, bigger yoke on the gearbox side. Actually, the, the drive shaft could be the same. I could just change the yoke, except the drive shaft shape in place is not going to do it because they want to sell you a brand new drive shaft. But they're not that expensive. They're about a buck and a half, maybe 300 bucks. Yeah. Not 250 to 300 bucks. See what I was saying before about the racing meat? Yeah. Oil pan? This is an original Mazda part that Racing Beat has uh, basically contracted Mazda to keep making them for them. They probably buy several hundred at a time because, you know, it, it's, it sells a lot. It's an OEM part. There's your Racing Beat sticker and there's your Mazda sticker. By the way, if anybody wants to buy one, part number is N305-10-700A. A for the old 12A, etc. 
except it's not. That was just a joke. This is a, the 13B GSLC oil pan. As you can see, the gearbox sits in the exact position and the little hump for the oil pickup is exactly where it needs to be. Yeah. That's a straight shot. You gotta add a little bit of length to either one of these. And uh, we're in. We're in like flint. Regardless, if I, I'll look to see if I have a slightly longer piece. But that's, that's basically what we want to do put a bead on both of these ends and uh, we got our we got our charge line actually this one come from no, I don't need to lengthen it actually I got plenty we're we're above the chassis and we're behind the air conditioning belt Maybe Mazda should hire me. <laughs> if you begin to tighten it up, you put a nice little bead so your coupler won't slide out. Um, one thing that I'll, I, I have found to be very important is to grease the roller so that uh, it makes squeezing it, squeezing the metal a lot easier. Practice, full rotation, good to go. So we begin to squeeze it little by little. generation upper intake. So yeah, it's, it's far from what it was originally.
Could he have used that excessive low intake manifold here? Um, yeah, could have. No, I couldn't. No, because that's that's a, for a third gen block, and this is a treble two block. See, this is a treble two lower intake manifold with a flange welded to accept the ninety three. Right. So the excess, they don't make an excessive for the for a treble two, only for third gen. What's the difference? <laughs> the ports. The, yeah. the treble two block, the port comes out like that, like the old 12 A's, yeah. and the 93 block comes in at an angle, and it's substantially taller. Actually, if you if you were to take that channel, it's it's a visual thing, it's a visual illusion. If you were to take the cross section of that channel and lay it down, it would be the same height as the treble two. But when you shift the walls, then it grows. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? You go like this, right. and you got a much bigger angle here and a much bigger angle here, but the, but the center line is the same. You go like that versus like that. You do it with a protractor. You can see what I'm talking about. All right, but at least uh, I gotta get to nothing here. I'm not sure that I had the max. <sighs> So is this a Frankenstein engine or what? Yeah, you, can say that. <laughs> you got third gen internals, third gen upper intake manifold, second turbo two lower intake manifold with turbo two oh. irons, is that what it is? Actually you would call this a custom built engine. Right, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Frankenstein. <laughs> Frankenstein would be. Well, you said you didn't like the uh, third gen rotors before. That's where right. Right, exactly. But a Frankenstein, what I would consider a Frankenstein, and believe me, I've done it. I <laughs> will, but I've done it. Is to take, let's say, um, a third gen rotor and a six port rotor. Okay, yeah. You know? Just throwing together yeah, stuff or, there. Or, I mean, that would be really careless. Want to be a little more careless and care, careful and still be a Frankenstein, a Cosmo uh, rotor versus a third gen rotor. They pretty much weigh the same, they look the same, and the bustle chamber is totally different. That I would consider a Frankenstein. Another Frankenstein, which <laughs> I don't want to say it, but we all have done things. Um, one rotor with two millimeter seals, one rotor with three millimeter seals. <laughs> I did a motor one time, and it turned out to be one of the best engines I ever ran. This, this was a true Frankenstein. Um, I had three piece two millimeter seals, one piece two millimeter seals. One rotor was damaged, so I had to cut it with three mils. So that one rotor had a three millimeter seal and two two millimeter seals. <laughs> the motor had gotten so badly overheated that the housings were warped to the point that you could visually see the separation between the rotor housing and the side plate. I've got pictures of it. You could stick a feeler gauge reading seven thousandths of an inch. <laughs> okay, so I took those housings, put them on the mill, and milled them flat. In doing so, the housing got narrower. So now the rotor was wider than the housing. Right. So, went ahead and clearance the rotor. The, the, the standard amount plus however narrow the housing was. So the rotors were really thin. Um, but you saved the engine and it was a good running that engine. That thing ran like I scolded the puppy from the first try. It was like, Ch -ch boom! <laughs> like that. And I mean, torque up the ass. I 
sat there to kind of like analyze why it ran so well. I mean, it really ran well. Um, what ended up happening, which is my belief that was one of the contributions why it ran so well, was as you clearance the rotor, the, the side seals stick out further more. Because the depth of the side seal groove remains the same. You take material from either side, and the you know the, the groove is here, the, the rotor is here. You take material, you, you thin the rotor, you clean the rotor. The depth of that groove still remains the same. So the side seal sticks out, but the, the rotor housing being narrower. Follow where I'm going. Now the side seals had more pressure. Against right. The that's what I was going to say. More spring pressure. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, Sealed the motor, but I can't say that I'm proud of it with that state brand. Would it, would it have raised the compression? Yeah. That motor, that, that, that was, was it a turbo or a normal? Yeah, it was a third gen motor that the, that the kid cooked. I mean, just absolutely cooked it and he had it sold. And um, it, it, his dad had a dealership and he just went out joyriding, just, just burned the crap out of the motor. And they, they had to, they already had worked on a deal for a little bend. And uh, they brought it to me to put it together. And they said, you know, charge whatever you want to charge, but we're not spending a penny on parts. You know, and they needed like in four days. <laughs> and uh, I would have never done it except that, you know, um, I was already doing some other business deals with the father. So I wanted to help them out, but I told them I can't guarantee it's even going to run. And, <laughs> that was a Frankenstein. That car in second gear, when the second turbo will come in, will just, just light up the line. <laughs> it didn't have a bunch of aftermarket stuff on it? Intake and exhaust? No, no, it was all bone stock, twin turbo. Bone stock. It just ran hard. Had an exhaust, so Mickey Mouse little filters. <laughs> Unbelievable. Don't try this at home. We have paint between the manifold and the engine. Didn't have tape to protect the engine. Any, anything you do up here can actually fall into the motor. It's not a very smart thing to do. inside the intercooler that, to blow it out yeah so you need to blow it out but uh, put the fuel rail on put the throttle body on and uh, hook up the the uh, what do you call it the crank angle sensor computer. yeah that's just a drop in deal on time to motor um, what do you call it the um, the microtech that I have for my for my RX3 race car I'm just going to throw it on here. That's, you know, that's about five minute installation. Um, we've got to put a few, you know, fuel injection fuel pump and do some the plumbing down pipe. and make the down pipe and this, that, and the other. So. Oh, 
fly a bunch of crap. A regular one of these will, <coughs> will uh, without the injectors will work better. Is that going to be the uh, racing league or whatever you're going to be racing? No, that's fair. I used to race SCA. That's where I won two championships. But um, I haven't really raced anything on my own since like 2007. And you know, to be quite honest with you, Things are so expensive nowadays, you know. I used to travel the whole country, you know. Um, at least here in Florida, we have Homestead, we have Seaburn, we have Daytona, uh, Savannah, Georgia, which is just outside Florida. Um, oh, <laughs> Moroso. I know Moroso like the back of my hand. I, mean, I, I, I had a record there for a suit for about two years with a fuel loader car. So, you know, I mean, we got plenty of tracks to, to race SCCA here in Florida. The Farrah races primarily at, uh, at Homestead, but they, we ran a, a 500 miler this year at Sebring. And uh, next year they got one event at, at Moroso and one event at, uh, at Daytona. So, you know, it's just come, comes to a matter of economics. I mean, ga ga travel expenses have become so expensive. Gasoline, travel expenses for gasoline, and then your hotel room. So, you know, I, I intend to kick some ass locally, and uh, maybe we'll land a sponsorship. The guy you said the other day is bringing you the race car? Or the yeah, yeah, yeah. Prepare. He's sending a race car up from <clears throat> Santa Domingo. Uh, he's an accomplished driver. What kind of car is it? It's uh, an old, uh, well, not, not old, but it's at, at the prime time of IMSA GT racing. It's a Al Bacon car, a uh, transaxle car. A motor in the front and a helium transaxle in the rear, and a drive shaft in the center. Uh, that was like the uh, the, the epitome of, of, of touring car development. Uh, the, you know, the, 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 the maximum. Granted, by today's standards, they're you know the same the same exact concept has been fully developed to the maximum. You know, like prototype cars with, with touring car bodies on. Um, Essentially, that's what Riley and Scott did with the Speed Switch cars, you know? Uh, three rotor engine in the front, which was really restricted by Grand Am standards, you know? But uh, uh, X, six speed sequential X truck in the back. Uh, it's a prototype thing. Absolutely incredible. Thing. This is not going to be very easy. Because the angle is wrong. And it's not quite 45 degrees either. It's more like 30 degrees. I'm probably going to have to chop this off around here and make a straight shot and weld it. That'll be cool. That's about the only option we got. And that's a 45. I don't know, it's not. I don't know. I'll check uh, the website, uh, Treadstone's website. Maybe, maybe they got something I could use. I gotta go there tomorrow anyway to uh, pick up the flange to make the downpipe and um, a couple of other little knickknacks. 
But this is it. Got full all of a sudden, huh? <laughs> Bro. We gotta move some cars out of the way so we got room to build these RX-8s, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. This motor here, it's just, you know, it's, it's a nicely ported engine. It's got, it's got a bunch of good shit. You know, it's got three millimeter seals for durability. It's got 93 rotors, which, you know, I despise, but that's a different story. They still make good power. Um, 93 intake, <laughs> damn good size turbo, excellent intercooler. I mean, what, where I'm getting at is that it's way too much motor for this little car. It's got a good gear, good turbo gearbox. I mean, if this guy wants to be a hot dog, he can just sit there and smoke the tires off the rims. <laughs> <laughs> Take it to the uh, quarter mile and warm them up real good. <laughs>